the role of the fintech can't sort of be underestimated as we head in head into the future. Um, the way I see it, the, the big commercial banks, um, they've always had the the stability and the the customer bases um, for their for their for their customers. Like they don't really innovate; they're pretty cumbersome in their innovations. They haven't really got a big incentive to drive um, change and innovation within the banking sector. Um, but however, with with fintechs, that's really what they do. They provide that um, competitive edge. They provide that innovation. Um, they provide the payment rails, um, which the which the big commercial banks can use. And many people look at fintechs being competition to to the big banks, but I don't see it like that. I, I see. Welcome to the Exponential Investor Podcast. Want to be a better, smarter, more clued up investor? Well, you've come to the right place. We cover the breakthrough investment ideas you don't hear about in the mainstream to keep you on top of the mega trends and opportunities reshaping our world. And welcome back to this week's Exponential Investor Podcast. I am your host, Shay Russell, and joining me today is not your other normal host, Sam Volkering. It is Elliot and Elliot. I forgot to get your surname before we came on. So I will let you give everybody your surnames. But everybody <laughs> listening, Elliot, you might by it might be the first time that you are seeing his face today, but Elliot has been around the traps for a considerable period of time. He works along, uh, along with Sam Volkering on his publications as an analyst. Ali, I'm going to throw to you, seeing as I did such a poor job of introducing you to the audience for the first time, tell me a little bit about yourself and what you're doing with Sam, and then we're going to get up to some of the advent adventures you've recently had with Sam. <laughs> hi, Shay. Hi, everyone. Yeah, great to be here. First podcast of many, I hope. Um, yeah, my surname is Playo, actually. So yeah, Elliot Playo, a bit of a strange one there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I've just been working with Sam on um, Frontier Tech Investor and um, Revolutionary Trend Investor, uh, two of the other publications that we have um, in South Bank Investment Research. Um, I've been here for about a year and three months now, so still pretty early days. But um, yeah, I'm just starting to do some more extra stuff around the business now, which is which is good, contributing contributing towards the XI and then doing my first podcast today with Shay. So yeah, looking forward to what the future holds. <sighs> All right, uh, Elliot, thank you very much for saving my bacon there. I appreciate it. Now, let's kick, kick off into something a little bit more fun. Uh, so the re one of the reasons why Sam has been MIA the past couple of weeks is I believe you two are down in Amsterdam at a money conference. Now, can you please give everybody a bit of a rundown about what this money conference was? Yeah, of course. So, yeah, like, like Shay said, uh, myself and Sam, we went to the Money 2020 conference in Amsterdam. Um, it was a sort of a showcase event where finance professionals from all around the world um, meet to discuss the latest investment trends in the financial markets. Um, that includes everything to do with crypto, uh, fintech, uh, the metaverse, uh, sustainability, all that good stuff that's currently um, sort of within the financial markets. Um, and it was also sort of a, a networking event as well, really. Um, it was a good chance for some of the fintechs there to set up a stand and, you know, really um, advertise and market their service to professionals from all over the world. So, yeah, it's a three day event. It ranged for about two of the days as well. So that wasn't ideal, but luckily we was looked after inside. So, yeah, we uh, we got a lot of good stuff from that. And hopefully we can use that to identify some trends heading into the future. All right, I'm going to come back to that networking comment you just made. Um, but first of all, let's start with the metaverse. Now, uh, Elliot, there is a good chance there's a couple of decades between you and I. I remember when Facebook came out and announced that there was going to be a meta metaverse. Now, I've got a kid that plays Roblox, uh, Roblox, Roblox. I'm not even sure what it is. And she's constantly wanting money to put into it. Actually, the two of them are. Can you please explain to me for an oldie like me and hopefully a couple of other people out there, what the hell is a metaverse? <laughs> I'll give it my best shot. Um, so yeah, a metaverse, it's um, a virtual immersive world where people can sort of perform daily tasks that they would do in the physical world. So for example, in the metaverse, you can have your own virtual avatar created and you can um, engage with friends in like social interactions. You can also do other things like buy land, uh, buy property, um, buy clothes, buy assets. A lot of the crypto networks at the moment, including uh, projects like Decentraland and the Sandbox, are utilising the metaverse. So you can go into those networks and buy plots of land and then hopefully sell it on for a capital gain like you normally do in the physical world. 
Um, but the way I look at the metaverse, it's it's um, it's like a bridge between blockchain, um, non fungible tokens, NFTs, um, which you probably might have heard of before. But if you haven't, they're just sort of digital assets represented by blockchain, and um, the the metaverse can act as sort of a, a platform for those NFTs to be swapped. And yeah, it's just it's just acting as a massive inflection point and uh, intersection for all these different trends. Um, and yeah, like you said there, Shay, about Facebook. Facebook are one of the big early movers in the metaverse. So they've got their very own um, Oculus headset, which is one of those big goggle headsets that you put on your face. And, you know, you look a bit silly, but, you know, you sort of whisk your head around looking at all the looking at all the interactions on, on the headset. Um, you can play games. And yeah, it's, it's really, really cool. But we've got to remember as well, it's really early stage. Um, it's still at such a nascent state. But some some big big um, big financial players are sort of just looking to get into the space. Uh, so for example, um, one of the guys there speaking was Steve Suarez from HSBC. And um, he reckons that by 2026, um, all of us, like all adults, will spend at least one hour per day in the metaverse, which I thought was a pretty, pretty interesting statement. So um, the use case for the metaverse is, is broad, you know, NFTs. He was speaking about banking being from HSBC. You know, there's an idea that we can sort of rock up to the metaverse one day and be able to visit our our physical branch in an online version or exchange value over the metaverse and make it more seamless and efficient. Um, so yeah, there's just so many possibilities with the metaverse. Um, it's it's really mind boggling. Um, yeah, I hope that's a good definition. I know it's pretty broad and there's a lot to cover there. But <laughs> no, look, it, it sounds good. So I, I'm going to ask you this follow up question here. And this, remember, for everybody listening, this is coming from somebody who likes rocks and has a rock collection that I'm always eager to show people. Why would anybody want to own virtual land? Like, is this a recreational activity? Is this what we're doing for escapism? Like, is this a new? Is the metaverse part of a new hobby that we're working out how to monetize? I think so. Yeah, I think from the physical world has got all its issues, right? And and one of the concepts of the metaverse is this escape from reality. It's just a little bit of respite from what's currently going on in the world. But then also as well, like if you know how to go about it in the right way, you actually can make um, make a financial return. For example, if you're getting in early. Um, I don't know, Indie Central Land or the Sandbox and buying plots of land at a reasonable price and demand for that for that land goes up um, as the demand for crypto goes up, then you can actually make a capital gain on that land and you can sell it in the native token and sort of convert it into the fiat currency, sell it on for more and that sort of thing. So whilst it is an escape, it's, it is actually a way to, to produce money, uh, sorry, to produce income. And we've seen that in other versions as well. We've seen that with uh, blockchain gaming, which is also a feature of many crypto networks. Uh, play to earn gaming um so yeah it's really taking on several meanings and yeah like you say i definitely think it's an escape but it's also a way to actually make money so the best of both worlds um pardon the pun <laughs> look i'm not going to be too critical of tech because one thing while i am an early adopter of technology i'm certainly not uh, i don't always see the possibilities of it and a friend of our, a friend of mine in australia he once told me that there would be like esports was going to be the next big thing. This was 20 years ago, and you know now we have an esports ETF kind of thing. So uh, when it comes to calling mega tech trends, I'm certainly not the person to do that. I will leave that to you and Sam. Now while we're talking of mega tech trends, uh, you did mention something earlier uh, earlier in your opening today, uh, and that is uh, merging fintech in with the current financial system. Now, I, yeah. you know, I'm a little bit of a gold bug in saying that I, you know, I take, I pay for most things with my card or my phone these days. I, I don't often pay yeah. with cash. Tell me from your takeaway from this conference, how, what were they talking, you know, how did you, what, sorry, let me rephrase this. What there are two take, there's two points I sort of want to draw out of your answer. And one is what was your big takeaway? You and Sam, what did you and say, um, Sam walk away from, you know, how fintech's merging with the financial system, as well as what were some kooky or even crazy ideas coming out of this conference of the possibilities of the, the two merging together? Yeah, definitely. So I think that the fin the role of the fintech can't sort of be underestimated as we head in head into the future. Um, the way I see it, the, the big commercial banks, um, they've always had the the stability and the the customer bases um, for their for their for their customers like they don't really innovate they're pretty cumbersome in their innovations they haven't really got a big incentive to drive um change and innovation within the banking sector um but however with with fintechs that's really what they do they provide that um competitive edge they provide that innovation 
um, they provide the payment rails um, which the which the big commercial banks can use. And many people look at fintechs being competition to to the big banks, but I don't see it like that. I, I see the the fintechs and the big banks sort of working off each other. So, so like I just said there, the fintechs have the innovation, and whilst the big banks have the um, the stability and the customer base to sort of give them that platform. Um, but yeah, the beauty of the fintech is that they, they do so many so many different things that the big banks just, just aren't capable of because they're so specialised. So for example, some fintechs specialise in pro- providing crypto liquidity, which you know the big banks just literally haven't got a clue of. Um, they can also provide stuff like open banking, which is one of the, the biggest things that we're seeing in the traditional finance-based economy at the moment. And for those of you that don't know, that's when um, uh, banks can give access to third-party vendors. So basically they can see your spending patterns and deliver a more tailored and personal banking experience to you. Um, so yeah, the, the fintechs and the commercial banks just just bounce off each other in that respect. Um, it's really interesting to see the way that they're sort of amalgamating and intertwining. But also what I think is interesting to see is that some of these fintechs are actually having the potential to go on and actually IPO and potentially develop into one of those big commercial banks themselves. So it's a bit of a balance in that. They're helping the big banks, but then they could also maybe engulf them in the future. Um, but yeah, just in terms of like their latest innovations that we found really appealing, Sam and I, um, it was definitely the open banking um, and the crypto liquidity. Crypto liquidity is massive amongst fintechs now. Um, it, it's, it's, it's getting so big. Like JP Morgan, they've even got their own head of, head of fintechs. Um, to actually like seal commercial partnerships and deals with the fintech so it's just it's taking on a new meaning that's really going to grow into the future um i think so let's stay on the open banking topic for a second because one of my pet hates with um digital ads is you're gathering my data but yet they're targeting me so poorly so i don't i don't see the point like if i'm handing over my data if part of this exchange is that i hand over my data you should target me properly. Like you should be identifying where I'm clicking, what I'm clicking on. Uh, and, you know, it worked out that I'm not buying skimpy dresses for a nightclub. I'm a mother of two. I'm, I'm likely buying a bottle of wine and getting it delivered kind of thing. So what um, I'm hearing, if I'm hearing this correctly, open ba- um, banking is, is it identifying your spending habits to encourage other customer, uh, other businesses to target you effectively, to advertise to you more effectively? Or is it more from a um, financial point of view to help you make better money-saving decisions? Um, I I think it's um, the second one. So with, with open banking, like they can see with, with the APIs, the application program interfaces, they can see like what your spending patterns are. Um, so you log into your banking app now, like I just done it earlier um, with Noise Bank, and at the bottom there's a, an open banking option, and and with that you can get like tailored um, tailored needs to your banking stuff. So I've just spent something in, um, what was it, Sports Direct. And then you can get like, I've got something in there from open banking saying, I'll go and get some and so cash back in Sports Direct. And how about try these out as well? Okay. So it's sort of just seeing like your spending patterns and how they can best tailor that banking experience to you. But, th- but then also through open banking, you can also access your other banks. So, Say, for example, I've got a Lloyds bank. I could click onto open banking in um, my Lloyds application and then just select Santander to uh, become part of that interface. So I can see my Santander banking within that Lloyds bank. So it, it's, it's got a couple of meanings, I'd say. Um, but it really is changing the way that banking's working. It's making things more efficient, more insightful, more tailored. And with, with the fintechs driving it, I do really think that that's a big area for innovation for the banking sector and something which the, the commercial banks are looking at. Um, yeah, it's definitely got big potential. Look, that's certainly uh, a trend I will be keeping my eye on because uh, one thing I managed to do throughout the entire pandemic was shop. Um, everything just got delivered to my door. So I managed to survive the pandemic that way, although inflation may change my spending habits sooner rather than later. Yeah. Now, I want to move on to the networking comment that you started with um, back right at the start of today's chat. Now, uh, I myself was at a conference last week in Australia, the Australian Gold Mining Con- uh, Gold Mining Conference, um, and one of my absolute uh, must-dos when it comes to understanding the mining sector is having my ear to the ground. And I can't tell you how many times... 
I've seen deals being made in front of me or heard whispers that have changed investment decisions that I have made or caught wind of, you know, my favourite is catching wind of geologists that are throwing money at a junior that hasn't even listed on the stock exchange yet because if the geologists are throwing money at something, you know it's going to be good. Tell me, from a yeah. fintech um I don't actually know what to call this conference, and I'm not even trying to sound patronising. Um, like this, this fintech money conference, it's clearly an industry to industry event, so it's not talking to the retail audience. From a networking point of view, are you in the position to you know pick up the same sort of whispers in the industry and hear of the deals being made uh, before the rest of the audience? Is is that one of the benefits of um, the network networking aspect of this? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, there, there's a couple of interesting bits in there, actually, uh, just concerning initial public offerings. Um, it, <laughs> I don't know whether I can sort of reveal it on on this call, but there, there's a couple of there's a couple of fintechs who were looking for IPOs over the next year. Um, Let's not name anybody. Must say. Let's not. We don't want yeah, to embarrass okay, our regulators. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah. What I said earlier about the fintech seeking to IPO, it, it was sort of a, an event to give people an idea about what their future plans are, what their future projections are. So, yeah, there was a couple of fintechs seeking to IPO within the next year, and mainly in the, the crypto space as well. So I think that could be start of a trend, the fintech IPOs, just as they get more traction behind them, just as they begin to work, work more with the, the big commercial banks, just as you know, open banking continues to grow. Um, but yeah, the event, you do sort of get um, a head start as to what's going on um, than if he wasn't there. So yeah, without breaking any compliance laws, that's what I say to that one. <laughs> Look, that is uh, for, you know, so our compliance department doesn't have a heart attack. I think that's actually a great place to leave today's conversation. Elliot, I want to say thank you yeah. very much for joining me. Uh, thank you very much for filling in for Sam while he's absent. Now, I will just let everybody know listening. I don't actually know if Sam will be joining me on this podcast next week. It might be Elliot again. Who knows? Stay tuned. Make sure you join might us next week. Uh, thanks for listening. And to quote Sam, bye for now.